Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. So for those with, uh, with stamina who have stayed with us uh, so, so, so far, we have the great... Uh, Great closing talk by Madhu Sudan on imperfectly shared randomness in communication. Okay, so thanks, Yuval. So thanks for uh, arranging this uh, theory day. Uh, it's really great to be celebrating theory within Microsoft, even if we are a little less strong than we used to be, or maybe not in a strict sense. We've done well since, but we definitely lost a few people in the recent past. So Raghu, thankfully, is now at uh, UCLA. And this was joint work when Raghu and Clement and Venkat were all at MSR in New England. Um, and we started thinking about this question. So what's this talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about communication complexity. Very quick uh, introduction to those of you who haven't seen this. Uh, you have two players, Alice and Bob. Uh, there's, they have some private inputs, x and y. And they want to compute some joint function, f of x. Uh, and typically, 0 or 1 valued functions are the ones that we are thinking about. And they are allowed to do some interaction. And the way I want to think about it, Bob wants to compute this function. So Bob outputs f of x, y at the end. And the question that we are usually interested in asking is, over all the possible interactions that we could consider, which is the one which minimizes the number of bits that they exchange? Okay. And today, it will be very important to talk about uh, randomized communication strategies. So here, there's some randomness which is shared between Alice and Bob. And uh, uh, they're now allowed to output the correct value with probability at least 2 thirds. So that's the change in the model. And now, once again, we can still continue to ask questions about this. So now, why do people usually study communication complexity? Well, Noam is not here anymore. He wrote the book on it. So I would suspect he may agree or not. But by and large, if you look at the bulk of the literature on it, it's focused on proving lower bounds in communication complexity. If you ever give a lower bound which is little less than n, then you know your paper is rejected. So you want to communicate. <laughs> the, the holy grail is to get good, strong lower bounds. And then these things to have lots of applications, circuit complexity, streaming, data structures, et cetera, et cetera. But today, I really want to think about it as a positive concept. I mean, look, I mean, I, if I'm out here trying to figure out how to design a web, uh, web form or some such thing, I want to understand what is the user likely to be, uh, know and care about, what are the things that I should tell them about all the services that I have to offer, what would I like to do at the end is to minimize the total amount of communication. The user is not going to sit around on this website forever and ever. They're going to do something quickly. They're going to go away. What kind of a uh, website should I offer them? What's the right way to study this? I would say, look, actually, this communication complexity is the right model to be studying these kinds of things. A particular thing that I want to, in the long run, talk about, but not something that we'll get to today, is you know, when we talk about human-human communication or computer-to-computer -computer communication, these are often cases where these are, you know, inputs are huge. The x and the y and so on that you're thinking about are huge. What is the context for today's talk? of mine, well, all the knowledge of English that I have, all the you know, current socio-political uh, things that we might want to invoke, all the mathematics that I know, and the same on your end. But these two are not exactly matched. Okay? So do I really need to know all the words in English that you know in order to be able to design this talk? And if I do, it is going to fail miserably. So there is going to be a large amount of context. The communication is relatively brief. I really want to think of communication as extremely short you know, rapid fire communications tweet. <laughs> uh, Twitter is a good example. And on the other hand, the contexts are always large. And the contexts are not going to be shared perfectly. This is roughly the kinds of things that we want to talk about. Uh, this is the kinds of things that I'd like communication complexity to be able to address. I'm not going to get there today. Today, we're going to talk about one very simple idealized mathematical problem in this space. But, you know, just this is the general uh, picture that I want to start thinking about. So what is in this talk? Two things that I want to do. One, which is basically just a little bit of pedagogy. We've had lots and lots of, I mean, there's a book, there's other surveys on communication complexity. Most of them start off and they'll say, here is one protocol, and now let's start doing what we really want to do, lower bounds. I want to change that thing. I want to give you a few different problems which have low communication complexity protocols, and I want to just sort of 
tell you about these that they exist. Uh, mainly because I want to say that actually low communication complexity is very interesting and this is the context in which I want to talk about some extra levels of uncertainty and how to overcome, you know, how to make communication protocols more reliable under a new notion of error or unreliability. Okay. All right, so this is uh, one talk, uh, one slide which I hope will be very, very useful to many of you. There's nothing here that's new. However, it's uh, uh, very uh, uh, things that you might not have all put together on the same page in the past. One of the most basic problems, I mean, there are a few problems where communication complexity is very small deterministically, but that's sort of not the interesting ones. The interesting things happen when really I cannot take all the input in my head and put it in some small number of equivalence classes and still manage to communicate very little to you and get you to figure out the computer function. One of the simplest problems of this type is equality. I have a big string x in my head, you have a big string y in your head. We want to know if these two strings are equal or not. Okay. The communication complexity of this problem under this shared randomness model is a constant, fixed constant. Depends only on the error. The error we fix to be two thirds, so it's constant. What is this protocol? Um, it's actually very, very elementary, but I'll mention it anyway because it starts introducing some things that I'll use later anyway. The way you should, you know, one way to check for equality is I could look at a, the randomness tells us to look at a particular coordinate of x and y and we look at it. But that's clearly going to be a very bad idea if x and y happen to differ in only one coordinate. Okay. So what do you do? It's the very most obvious thing. You don't talk about x and y, you talk about the encodings of x and y in some error correcting code. So use an error correcting code. Now these strings differ in a constant fraction of the places. Your randomness tells you to look at a particular coordinate. You just exchange that particular bits of x and y, of the encodings of x and y, and check and see if they're equal. Clearly a constant number of bits, and you get as small an error probability as you want. Okay? That's protocol number one. Now, there are a few other problems. I mean, actually, for most people, I think it stops right here. That's the constant communication. Uh, that's the landscape of constant communication complexity. No, it's not. There's a few other problems which are all generalizations of these. Um, Hamming distance, but in a s restricted sense. We are given two strings x and y, and uh, we want to say one if the Hamming distance between them is at most k, where k is, think of k as a constant, 5 or 10, and you want to say 0 if the Hamming distance is large. This is an extension of the previous problem. The previous problem was k equal to 0. Okay, if k equal to 0, we had the identity problem. Here, it turns out you can actually do some thing fairly uh, reasonable, which will get us to k log k bits of communication. I'll tell you some weak approximation to this in a minute. That's one other problem where you have constant communication independent of the length of the input. Here's another problem. We are looking at small set intersection. So think of x as the characteristic vector of some set, y as the characteristic vector of some set. Both sets are of size at most k. Okay. The universe is massive. There's two sets, x and y, of size at most k. And you want to know if they intersect or not. Here, there's a very clever protocol due to Hostad and Vigdeson, which gets k bits of communication. If you don't want to be very clever, then there's a very simple way of getting some poly in k bits. How, how, does these, how do these things work? Very simple. We have lots of common randomness. We can design a pick a random hash function. Pick a random hash function which maps the universe to something like k squared bits. There'll be no collisions. Now, if you use this hash function in some appropriate way in each one of these cases, you'll be able to reduce the universe size to something like k squared. You can just exchange all the bits that you want to exchange in this universe, you get sort of part in K communication. Okay. That works out quite nicely. You have, again, constant communication protocols independent of the length of the input. Ravi? So in all these, uh, the shared randomness is order log n bits? In all these, the uh, shared randomness is order log n bits. And it's not a coincidence. It comes uh, without loss of generality. Uh, there's a theorem due to Newman, which says that any problem you want to solve, uh, with shared randomness, you only need to use log n bits of randomness. It's a, it's a sort of a, it's a variation of the same proof that went into Edelman's theorem, but when you apply it here, you still need some randomness. Um, now comes the nice problem, which I don't think has been sort of studied in the communication complexity literature itself. Uh, however, it's uh, 
it is actually well studied in a different literature where they actually offer a solution which looks like a communication complexity solution. And this is what I call the gap inner product question. So in communication complexity there is an inner product, but here we are talking of real vectors and real inner product. So I have in my head a unit vector in n dimensional real space, you have in your head a unit vector in n dimensional real space, what we want to know is their inner product but we can't estimate it exactly. So we are happy to estimate it to within a gap of plus or minus epsilon, something like that. Or in general, you want to say yes, if the inner product is sufficiently large, at least some number C for completeness, and you want to say zero if the inner product is less than S, S for soundness, can you do this? And, and it turns out that you can actually do this with uh, communication complexity, which is something like one over C minus S squared. So if C and S are separated by epsilon, epsilon, 1 over epsilon squared bits suffice to solve this problem. And I won't give you a full explanation of how this is done, but a very quick insight is the following. I have a huge vector in my head. I do not want to send you the huge vector. I will be able to reduce it to a single real number by the following observation. If you pick a random Gaussian vector in n dimensions, so in each coordinate it is a normal mean 0 variance 1 and it is independent across the coordinates. And I look at the inner product of g with x and the inner product of g with y and take their product, this, expecta this is uh, the expectation over g of this quantity, this is an unbiased estimator of the inner product. Okay? And it is even got pretty good variance. And if you now use this thing, I will we will use the shared randomness to define this vector g, I compute g times x, discretize and send it to you. That more or less gives you this uh, protocol. Okay? So it's a, it's a, by the way, I mean if you want to talk about communication complexity and applying it in the real world tomorrow, this is a pretty interesting problem. I mean I could imagine large number of communication problems being es uh, explained in terms of I have some objective in my head, you have some offering in your head, we, the gain that we are going to get by collaborating or interacting is probably this inner product. Okay. I mean it is a pretty reasonable thing and the fact that it can be solved very efficiently Maybe is important. Dimension reduction, right? <laughs> this is uh, probably dimension, yeah maybe I mean maybe I have the wrong reference here but uh, the, the for whatever reason this is, is you know, usually for vector differences. But you subtract out the length squared and so on, everything will work out. I think so, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's for dark products depends on the lengths of the vectors which you put in your C minus S. Right. I, over here I just normalize yeah. everything and so right, yeah. Good. Okay. So I uh, should thank my students Badi and Preeti who sort of you know put this taxonomy of what was known together for me. All right, so uh, those are the examples of problems which have short communication complexity. Um, that was not the goal of the talk, but I just did want to emphasize that there are many of these problems and these are the problems we will be coming back to to motivate the rest of the talk. Uh, the general question that I want to talk about is reliability in communication and to model some notion of uncertainty. Now what could uncertainty mean? Uh, modeling this is a lot of effort, a lot of uh, work goes into it. I will not be talking about any general settings, but I just want to draw this picture. You know, we have this Thing. Alice and Bob are talking to each other, and there are lots of things that are supposed to be common to the two. Anything that is common to the two you can sort of ask, you know, you can put it under a lens and say is it really common? So you can look at this wire that they are using to interact with each other. If you decide that it is not a reliable wire, then you get Shulman's problem of interactive communication and there has been a lot of work on that in the recent past. Now what we are going to do, I mean you could put any dividing line between the two and say look okay what about this function Bob wants to compute f of x y but what does Alice know about f I mean maybe she does not know everything it is probably a pretty reasonable setting too we do not get to it what we are going to look at is this middle arrow the randomness we are saying this common randomness which is shared between both the players what happens if that one is not really perfectly shared okay. so that is the question Alice and Bob do not share randomness perfectly only approximately what can you do? So I will tell you what the model is, I will tell you about some positive results and maybe a couple of slides on the negative results. All right. So, uh, so here is the model, what I will sort of go out and make, come up with a very simple clean model of shared ran, imperfectly shared randomness and this is all we will work with in the talk. There can be other variations that can be looked at but 
not in this talk. <laughs> All right, uh, so Alice gets a sequence of random bits. These are going to be plus minus one bits, just so that I can write everything else in nice formulae. Uh, and Bob gets a sequence of bits. The pair Ri, Si are all going to be independent, and they are all identically distributed. Okay, so over I they are independent. Ri is correlated with Si, and each one of these is going to have a marginal which is zero. Uh, sorry, marginal distribution expectation is zero, and the two of them are correlated, which means if you look at the product of Ri times Si, each one has the same distribution. The expected value is rho. Okay, so it just says. So when rho is positive, these are positively correlated. If rho was equal to one, these are identical. If rho is zero, these are independent. Um, <clears throat> I'll use ISR, maybe not <laughs> really used, but anyway, maybe in this slide I'll use ISR to denote the communication complexity of a function with imperfectly shared randomness, uh, where uh, the correlation between the individual pairs is rho. Um, Extreme cases, perfectly shared randomness is rho equal to one. Private randomness is rho equal to zero. Okay. Um, starting point for Boolean functions. Uh, now I'll come back to. I mean, I mentioned this already earlier. Clearly, you know, communication complexity of a function is upper bounded by its communication complexity with some correlation. This is perfect correlation. Some correlation. No correlation. But even this is upper bounded by the communication complexity plus log n. Why is this? Because of Newman's theorem, which says that in any problem, the total amount of randomness that you need is log n bits. Okay. So this already gives us a pretty good approximation to how good communication complexity of a function can be up to an additive log n. But I don't like additive log n's. In this talk, yeah? Everybody knows this row. Uh, yes, everybody knows this row. It's fixed and constant. <coughs> You need to know a lower bound on the row, and protocols will work. But uh, yeah, sorry. No, I'm just saying that to show that it's less than the private randomness. Uh, I guess you don't even need to know the row. You could have Alice use the odd bits, and uh, Bob use the even bits, uh, and and then it works out exactly. And uh, in general, actually, there's an even stronger monotonicity you can take anywhere. You can look in row and tau. I mean, I can just re-randomize every bit with a little bit extra thing, and then. All right, so, um, but what if the communication complexity of some functions are much, much less than log n? Like we've seen a few examples where it's a constant. Can you get a constant in those cases? Okay. So a little bit of a history. Um, we started looking at this question, and Clement went to this uh, uh, talk at ICALP, and he sees this paper by Bavarian, Gavinsky, and Ito with exactly the same model. Now, this wouldn't be such a dramatic surprise, except Bavarian is my student, and I had no idea that he was working on this problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so fortunately, they didn't have the same collection of goals and questions, so it wasn't <laughs> scooping us completely. But that's the only other paper that I know uh, in the literature which has really talked about communication complexity with this correlation. In general, in the literature on probability as well as information theory and signal processing, people have been looking at what can you do with some correlated randomness, even cryptography, quantum key exchange, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What can you do, but not in the language of communication complexity, which is what we're going to do today. But Varian et al. said, well, this plus log n makes this problem uninteresting, so we'll look at it in the sense of simultaneous communication, uh, which is a different model of communication complexity. Uh, for us, really, I, I am interested in two-party communication complexity, but I'm really interested in constant communication protocols. So here, for us, it still made sense. One of the things that they show, even in their sort of their model is actually you can do less in their model, but even their model, they show that equality testing actually has a constant bit communication protocol, even with imperfectly shared randomness. It's not completely trivial. If you look at the protocols we have, they are very, very sensitive to the randomness that you're using. You can't just convert it to a different one. So, and one of the things that I'll try to do is show you this. What we did was actually came up with a very general result, which says if you have a problem with communication complexity k, it's uh, communication complexity with imperfectly shared randomness is actually at most exponential in this k. This for every constant row between 0 and 1? For so every so constant row, which is strictly so positive, so yes. Um, and uh, we were very unhappy with this result and tried to improve it. And finally, we were able to prove that we couldn't improve it. 
So there is a function. It's not a, uh, it's not a function. There's a promise problem for which the communication complexity is at most k. But with imperfectly shared randomness, its communication complexity bumps up to 2 to the k. For every choice of k, there is one such thing. So I guess 2 depends on rho? Ah, OK. So there are some constants in front of all of these that depend on rho. Uh, but it's a constant. It's not in the exponent. It's not in the exponent. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of theoretical computer science notation. So. <laughs> Constants can be suppressed. O can be suppressed. Okay, all right. Um, all right. So, um, so in the rest of the talk, I'll try to tell you a little bit about the positive result, how it's obtained, and then uh, hint at the negative result. So uh, the positive result comes from thinking about inner products. And now, again, I'm talking of real inner products. What we are going to do is encode my vector x in an error correcting code, but error correcting code which is sort of uh, where bits are plus and minus one. Okay, just so that if you think of it as a real vector, it's a real vector of constant length. I mean, constant. Uh, okay, so you encode x into this big string capital X, y into this big string capital Y, and x and y are going to have this thing. If x and y are equal, little x and little y are equal, so are capital X and capital Y. The inner product between these two is n. Okay. If little x is different from y, then if your encoding is good enough, then the inner product here is at most n over 2. Okay. I mean, it goes from anywhere from plus n to minus n, n over 2 is safe enough. Okay. So what we're going to do is try and estimate this inner product. And the way we're going to do this is based on this sort of the sketching protocol that I already mentioned earlier. But we do it slightly differently. What we are going to do is the following. Alice will pick a collection of Gaussians. Each one of these is a capital N dimensional vector and T of these. And what she's going to send to Bob is she's going to pick the index i, which maximizes the inner product between g i and x. Okay. So if you've seen analysis of the coloring algorithm based on semi-definite programming and so on, this is very similar. You're looking, you have a vector in n dimensions, you pick n ran, k, t random vectors and pick the nearest guy. Okay. And Bob does not have these Gaussians. I mean, these are random Gaussians. Bob does not have them, but he has the ability to manufacture Gaussians which are rho correlated with Alice's Gaussians. Okay. Just take a collection of bits and average them out. And that gives you Gaussians. Okay. And they will, the correlation is preserved, at least positivity of the correlation is preserved. And now what she's going to do is look at the ith co coordinate over here of her, the ith Gaussian that she has, because he sent uh, Bob, sorry, Alice sent i, so Bob is going to look at the ith coordinate and he is going to check if this inner product between gi and y is positive or not. And if it's positive, he accepts. Turns out that this works out, you have to pick t to be something like um, all right, okay, so some constant t works for this example, but in general, if you're trying to measure in a product to within plus or minus, you know, epsilon when x and y are normalized to unit length, then this would, you would have to pick exponential in epsilon squared different Gaussians, and then you send the index of one of them, which is log of exponential of 1 over epsilon squared bits, 1 over epsilon squared bits. So this manages to work out, and this is what we call the Gaussian protocol, and it turns out to be very, very useful. How do you go from this very simple inner product problem, you know, equality testing problem, to a general case? Turns out inner products really capture everything in communication complexity. So this is quite standard if people have looked at it. If not, I'll just give you a very brief idea why this is the case. I mean, what does a, for simplicity, let's think of a one-way communication. Alice is going to send some message to Bob, and Bob is just going to spit out the value of the function. What kind of, what does this protocol look like? Well, Alice is going to send some message, some number between 1 and 2 to the k, k bits of information. So she's sending some information. And Bob is taking some function which says, given whatever Alice sends, what should he do, accept or reject? Alice's input is represented by an integer between 1 and 2 to the k, Bob by a function from 2 to the k to 1, 0, 1, OK? And what we know is that they have a sh perfectly shared random thing. I mean, so the, uh, if you look at all the different random strings on which they're doing, uh, they can use, 
for each random string they have come up with a possible message and a possible function to work with. And if you look at a random choice of r, this value fr of ir is the right value. Okay? That is the definition of having a communication protocol with k bits of communication and perfectly shared randomness. We want to take this problem and just solve it without having the perfectly shared randomness. First thing we were going to do is convert their strategy. Alice's strategy is a collection of integers i sub r over ranging over r. Bob's strategy is a collection of function f sub r ranging over r. We are going to take both of these strategies and represent them as vectors. It is a very natural representation of the vectors. So that is the same thing that I had earlier. The representation is simple. i sub r is just going to be represented by a unit vector of length 2 to the k. 1 in the coordinate i sub r and 0 everywhere else f sub r is going to be represented by the truth table of this function. Both of these are ve uh, vectors of length 2 to the k, their inner product is the value of the function. Okay? The only thing that is happening over here is that there is a certain normalization. These, this vector is of length 2 to the k, norm 2 to the k, L2 norm 2 to the k and you want to distinguish this inner product to within plus or minus 1. Okay? So, you want a 2 to the minus k approximation to this inner product if you normalize. That is the approximation that we will eventually have to compute and the Gaussian protocol can do it with about 2 to the k bits of communication. Okay? So all of that, okay, that is it. All right, so uh, this is how you do one way communication. Two way communication is again just the same thing. Again, you just look at the definition of what is two way communication, extract vectors and represent strategies as vectors and acceptance as inner products and do it. It turns out to be all similar. We, I won't do it in this talk because it's. So at the end, you get a theorem. No matter what function you have, if it has k bits of communication with imperfectly shared randomness, you get 2 to the k bits of communication. Okay. Uh, this may be actually, you know, I am not so sure, this may be actually 4 to the k because of some error, so, uh, some, so some form of 2. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the epsilon squared, I do not know what uh, happens to it. So, uh, I, okay, never mind. All right, so the main technical result in the work, uh, which I might not really get to, is uh, lower bound. Uh, says that there is a promise problem which can be solved with k bits of communication but the imperfectly shared communication complexity is exponentially large in k. It is actually some constant times 2 to the k but uh, again and once again this lower bound works as long as rho is less than 1. So for any rho less than 1 you get this lower bound. Um, first thing I want to tell you is what is this problem because I think even this problem is actually a natural and interesting problem and we should probably think about it occasionally. This is what I call the gap. See, the problems that we have been working with so far are the gap inner product problems. Inner product is large or small, distinguish between them. There is a gap between the good case and the bad case. Now we are going to have an additional feature which is sparsity. What is going to happen? Alice is going to get a very sparse vector in 0, 1 to the n. The vector is sparse in the sense only one out of every 2 to the k bits are 1s and the others are zeros. Okay? And now Bob gets a vector in 0, 1 to the n, they want to estimate the inner product. Now the largest that the inner product can get to be is 2 to the minus k times n, right? because that is the weight of the vector x. So it cannot be larger than that. And these are just, just looking at crude inner products, no normalization. So the promise that I will give you is in the good case, in the yes case, the inner product is 90 percent of the maximum possible. In the bad case, it is almost like x and y are uncorrelated, okay? so almost like 50 percent. And we have to decide which of these the problem is. Okay? So this is the problem, we want to do two things about it. We want to show that it has small communication complexity with perfectly shared randomness and we want to show that it has very high communication complexity if the randomness is not perfect. I will do one of the two. <laughs> okay? All right, so that is sort of a nemo, uh, just to remind you what the question is. Hopefully, it will stick around for the next slide. So, if we just decided to do the Gaussian protocol, we would have communication complexity of about 2 to the k for this problem, okay? and that would be ignoring sparsity. So, we want to do better by exploiting sparsity. What are we going to do? Um, the main idea is the following. If you can discover a random coordinate i, 
such that x i is non zero then y i is sort of positively correlated with uh, the answer right because uh, 90 percent of the time if x i is 1 y i will be 1 in the good case but it will only be 1 with probability 60 percent in the bad case so that gives us enough of a distinguishing advantage. So we want to discover a random coordinate i such that x i is 1 how do we do this well they share randomness they are sharing randomness perfectly that is the model that we have here. So what do they do they have a sequence of random numbers that is what the shared randomness is which is uniform over n okay just pick a random sequence and Alice will send to Bob the index of the first j such that x sub i sub j is non zero okay clearly it is a random I mean this is this is generating for us a random coordinate where x i is non zero okay. And how large is j going to be? Well, for each one of these coordinates, the probability that x i sub j is non zero is 2 to the minus k. So, amongst the first 2 to the k guys, you are going to find a non zero coordinate. I have to send you the index, which means I have to send you k bits. So, we got an exponential advantage on the trivial protocol. Okay. So, by looking at this problem carefully, we are able to get a significant advantage over the random the naive pro protocol and now the question is can you give a lower bound for this. So just a question, so, so, yeah. I mean 0.6 or 0.4 would make no difference. Would make no difference, I think 0.6 we just used to make sure that in the bad distribution we will actually pick x and y uncorrelated. So we just but want to make sure. it would be correlated negatively. Yeah. Negatively and this the result would hold yeah actually we just have to say things slightly different yeah. Great. Okay, so that's the protocol. Tells you why this works. Uh, now I'm trying to. So in the lower bound, I won't tell you, give you the lower bound, but I'll tell you about a few interesting things about it. First, um, you can't do the usual strategy in communication complexity. What's the usual strategy in communication complexity? Lower bounds. You fix a distribution, and then you say, well, on this distribution, the communication complexity is large. Okay. So you don't look at the worst case instance and the complexity you look at the average case complexity over a distribution. You can't fix a distribution anymore. If you fix a distribution there is a deterministic strategy which has k bits of communication. Okay, why because it is just I mean for every input there is a strategy which works with k bits of perfectly shared you know communication with perfectly shared randomness which means that for every distribution there is a randomized strategy which works with k bits of communication with perfectly shared randomness but then it is a distribution you can sort of flip the minimum the maximum or whatever and you now have a deterministic protocol. So you really have to do the things in the reverse order you have to look at the strategy that you are going to employ and then fix a distribution later okay and the distribution has to be tailor made to the strategy. This will not come out in the proof but it is I mean in the proof that I will describe but this is this is an ingredient that has to be there. Uh, one thing that we can we do need to do is to say look I mean there was this perfectly shared randomness protocol and you might try to implement something like that with your imperfectly shared randomness this should not work. Why will this not work we need to somehow rule out the following somehow or the other Alice and Bob may manage to agree on a common index i which is uniformly distributed between 1 and n where x i is non zero we need to rule this out. How do you rule this out? We show that look this immediately implies that they are agreeing on some randomness with high probability okay A large amount of randomness randomness of entropy log n bits with very little communication. We prove that if you want to agree on a large amount of randomness perfectly when you only have correlations to start with this takes amount of time which is uh, amount of communication which is proportional to the entropy that you are sharing. So you cannot agree on log n bit strings without log n bit uh, on an index between 1 and n without log n bits of communication even with correlations that you are sharing okay. So this is sort of uh, you know once you, we phrased it this way the, uh, the lower bound was in the literature but uh, that was. Now the other thing is I showed you a protocol which ignores the sparsity and achieves 2 to the k bits but is that the best possible? We proved that yes if you ignore the sparsity 
and so on. So these are some of the ideas behind the proof. The unfortunate thing is that the protocol could look like anything. So this is not an exhaustive list or doesn't look like an exhaustive list. But the remarkable thing is it almost does. And the formal proof of this goes through something called the invariance principle. And uh, it was an amazing uh, miracle when I saw this, uh, you know, the way this principle can be applied to get a reduction. Take any protocol and either Alice and Bob are really agreeing on some variable very with high probability and then, you know, sort of this way of strategy has some common influence in it and then, you know, you go, get sort of get to this setting or it turns out that it's actually <clears throat> ignoring all, it's not placing too high an influence on any coordinate, in which case you can actually replace bits by Gaussians and Gaussians, there's no notion of sparsity anymore. So, you know, you really sort of, you can't, and then you're forced with a two to the k lower bound. So this was sort of a remarkable uh, discovery. It was, comes in, you know, perfectly uh, suited for our setting and we were able to use it. So summarizing, if you have k bits of communication with perfect sharing, two to the k bits of uh, communication with imperfect sharing suffice. This is tight. And along the way, we, you know, we, the, the invariance principle is sort of very nice, very cute, but I feel, again, for the sake of utility, especially in either PCP literature or in the probability literature, there would be a different articulation of which, which would be very, very useful and nice. And we have in our paper I, what I think is a very, very convenient uh, uh, way of you, uh, stating it. And once we were able to do it, we sort of had a, a lower bound saying, if you have this thing, the, <clears throat> the one-way communication would be at least 2 to the k. And without almost any change in the whole uh, uh, proof, we were able to get it to 2 to the k just by making the invariance principle sufficiently general. So uh, I encourage you to look at our paper for uh, that version of the thing. So back to the big picture, I think this imperfect agreement of context is important. This is sort of um, something that we've been wishing away, but it's not true. Uh, and communication complexity in the classical sense, we try to abstract things as either you and I know this or you and I don't know this. A very firm division between me and you. But most natural communication is not along these lines. For everything that I know, there's some chance that you might know it and some chance that you don't. And we manage to leverage this uncertainty and still work with it in, you know, anecdotally, in common uh, uh, context, common uh, settings. Can we sort of make it more rigorous and prove that this happens in mathematical sentences? This is where we're going here. Um, and the other thing that I do want to say is that, yeah, you know, large context and short communication is certainly sort of an interesting range of parameters to think about. Okay, thanks very much. I'll stop here. Any additional questions? I'm tired. <laughs> 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 Well, ju just some, something about your first slide, oh, oh. Your motivation. Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem that, at least in human-to-human -human communication, um, you're trying to, uh, I mean, that it tries to minimize the, number, the, the information that it has. Uh, so, uh, is there, there are certain types of information that are much easier to comprehend than others. For example, pictures versus words. Right, okay, so, so uh, the measure of complexity may not be simply, uh, and it's also a function of what is uh, easy to achieve, right? I mean, I can certainly point to an object in the room and that's maybe a large number of bits of communication if you sort of look at all the different things. So, but there is a certain, I mean, we do want to minimize the total time it takes to get this communication done. Uh, and so... <laughs> <laughs> Some of us maximize, uh, I agree. <laughs> also, yeah. also, like, uh, I guess a lot of these things, uh, lower bounds are used to prove, let's say, lower bounds for steaming algorithms, like if you have a uh, this. But morally, like if you have a good, at least example that we showed by in the product, right, it came out in this 
the steaming also was used in steaming. But and there are other algorithms for steaming. So morally, aren't some of those also examples where you actually have low communication protocols for calculating certain functions as well? So like uh, uh, in streaming or yeah, let's say let's take an example from steaming algorithm. Aren't I, like because you're saying there are very few examples which are known which have a low communication and where you're calculating some function. Right. So so uh, up to an exponential factor in the communication, the inner product problem that I described is everything. In fact, we, we proved it in the, during the course of the talk, uh, almost. So everything else reduces to that. But then within that sc scope, once again, there are other things. I would think, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, small set intersection seems like a very reasonable thing to be thinking about. I mean, we've sort of narrowed our interests down to something reasonable small set where we might have an overlap and we sort of play the game of you know and now can we find it within this uh, space so so I, I mean in that sense I do think that it makes a lot of sense um, uh, to, to model things in terms of uh, communication is, is that the question uh, I, that I feel privately okay so let's thank uh, Madhu in particular